I don't know about in your states, but uh, in Texas, bacteria is our number one cause of water quality impairment, and throughout really the most of the U.S., that is the number one cause of water quality impairment for freshwater streams and rivers. This just shows uh, a map of the state of Texas and the different various impairments that we're dealing with, and you can see essentially anywhere we've got water in Texas, we've got a bacteria water quality issue. Um, so as we go to develop strategies for addressing the bacteria, identifying those sources is one of the key first steps to, to doing that. And like a colleague of mine likes to say uh, when we're talking to the public, anything that has hair, fur, or feathers can be a source of bacteria. So how do you figure out what is your primary sources? Some of the methods that have been used over the years uh, include things like source surveys, modeling, and bacteria source tracking. And they all have their pros and cons. Source surveys, basically you're just gathering data on animal numbers, and you can do that from the uh, ag census data, population census. Survey the number of septic systems and wastewater treatment plants that you have in your watershed, and utilize that type of information to try to figure out what are your major sources of bacteria. Some of the downsides to using just solely source survey data is it doesn't take into account the bacteria fate and transport. You know, that uh, manure that's deposited on the landscape and sits there for several months um, may not have the same impact that something uh, deposited directly into the, your river or stream would have. And secondly, we don't have good data on wildlife uh, numbers. So that's another really big drawback and as a result, a lot of the source surveys will show that beef cattle, particularly in Texas, is the biggest source of bacteria in our water. Um, something else that you can use is the models, a lot of the big hydrologic models. And those are typically based on that source survey, but they take into account the bacteria fate and transport. So it takes care of that, but the models still leave you with the issue of you don't have sufficient population data for, for much of your wildlife. So that's really where the bacteria source tracking has come into play in Texas and uh, we've been able to institute a, a good program that's really been able to better, more accurately show the impacts of all the different possible sources of, of bacteria that there might be. So our program was, was established in 2007, our bacteria source tracking program, and really we had done about a five year study comparing a number of different BST methods and uh, what we found is using a combined method of uh, ERIC PCR and I won't go through the long name of it and riboprinting using a, those two combined methods uh, we were able to pretty accurately determine what the sources of, of the bacteria was uh, in our water but both of these methods require the development of a BST library which can be very expensive uh, and both of these methods are considered DNA fingerprinting methods, so they produce um, fingerprints that look much like this. So to develop our BST library, the first thing we had to do is go collect fecal samples from all the various sources, fresh fecal samples. From that, we isolate the E. coli from those, and then from the isolated E. coli, we then develop the DNA fingerprint that's added to our library. So to date, we've, uh, our BST library contains about 1,600 E. coli isolates from about 1,400 different fecal samples and represents more than 50 animal subclasses. And we've really tried to distribute uh, our BST library pretty evenly. You can see we've got a lot of wildlife because there's just a lot more species there, uh, but about a third of it's from domestic animals and a quarter from, from human. And we've done uh, these collections from more than a dozen watersheds across the state, and as we do, do new projects, we're continually adding to our library and expanding it. So now that we have our library, we can simply collect the water sample, isolate that E. coli, get our DNA fingerprint, and compare that fingerprint to the library to come up with our source ID of where that bacteria is coming from. This map shows the watersheds and sub-watersheds that we've done BST studies to date. So about a dozen large watersheds or two dozen sub-watersheds. 
And these are predominantly rural watersheds. If you see this uh, pie chart here, 40% rangeland on average, 31% forest land, 5% or less is developed. So these are predominantly rural watersheds that we've looked at so far. And what we found in these predominantly rural watersheds is that about half of our bacteria is coming from wildlife. You know, our previous work and the previous uh, TMDLs that have been done in the state had really pinned probably about 80% of the loadings on grazing cattle and, uh, and then some very significant reductions uh, to uh, bacteria from, from the livestock industry. So this has really been a game changer for us. Uh, I show three-way, a five-way, and a seven-way split. This is uh, the way we typically look at the data. With this three-way split, that's looking at wildlife, human, and domestic animals. We have the greatest confidence in when we use these more broader categories. As we, I mean, we could identify it down to the level of what percentage is from domestic cats, what's from dogs, what's from raccoons. But when you get down to that level, um, the level of uncertainty increases. So every time you break it down a little bit more, your level of uncertainty with your uh, results uh, decreases. But um, we've got some pretty good confidence uh, even in our seven-way split at this point in time. Uh, just a few things to point out when we look at the wildlife. We can break it down to avian and non-avian wildlife. And you can see predominantly non-avian wildlife are, are the biggest contributor there. And we're starting to get some good data on, on cattle where we're pretty uh, uh, comfortable with our breakout of cattle and you can see about 13 percent of our bacteria loading is coming from from cattle in these water these rural watersheds that we've looked at to date so this has been a real game changer for us in our TMDL and watershed planning programs in the state having this type of information uh, much to the relief uh, of a lot of our cattle producers who were being pinned with you know, a predominant amount of the loading and uh, responsibility for a predominant amount of the, the decreases in the bacteria levels. One of the questions I've commonly gotten after I've presented this is, you know, do you see uh, any correlations with land use or do you, would you expect to find similar results in urban areas? So for this conference, I just took a real quick look at that and really didn't see any good relationships between land use and the different source classes. About the best one I found is between the percent of the watershed that's developed in pets. And as you would expect, uh, the more the watershed that's developed, uh, the more pets you would have, so the more loading you would get from them. And you know, this is kind of an outlier, so I took that one out. And still, we had a R square value of 0.54, and it was still a significant correlation there. Uh, I was surprised to see that we didn't really see uh, any correlation between percent of isolates from human and the percent of watershed developed, but there could be a lot of other factors there, you know, the number of septic systems, the uh, number of wastewater treatment plant discharges, and so forth. And looking at land use uh, versus cattle, um, I thought this was going to be a significant correlation, but it turns out that this isn't statistically significant here, um, but it's a pretty low uh, number of samples that we have. but really didn't see a correlation between watershed land use and the percent of isolates from cattle. And I just threw up three examples. I looked at it for a wide variety of different land use classes and so forth. And for wildlife, again, really didn't see a relationship there between land use and our BST results. About the best that we saw is between the non-avian wildlife and the percent of watershed that is pasture, forest, or, and range together but um, all the rest really didn't show any significant correlation. So, you know, based on the limited data we have so far, I don't really see any uh, significant correlations between land use and uh, the contributions from these different animal classes. But we're gonna look into that a little bit further as we get more data. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and show that we've not only seen these uh, the wildlife impacts in our BST sampling results, we've actually also seen them in some edge of field monitoring that we've done uh, in the state over the last few years. Uh, we published a, a paper in 2012, but we've 
gone on and done a, an additional two years of monitoring. So we have five years of data here where we looked at bacteria runoff from ungrazed sites, moderately grazed, and heavy grazed sites across the state. And one of our key findings was within about two weeks of us, uh, all of these sites were rotationally grazed, our grazed sites were. Within about two to four weeks of us destocking those sites, if we got a rainfall event, the bacteria levels really dropped down very significantly to what I call some background concentration. So this is what I really want to focus in on are these uh, values that we observed when the, our pastures were destocked for at least two to four weeks. When I compare our destock sites to our ungrazed sites, which are the circled ones here, you can see there is no difference between the bacteria runoff concentrations in those destock sites. So those bacteria concentrations drop very rapidly. But really the key take home here is that there is a very significant background concentration in runoff uh, coming from these sites from that resident wildlife population. You know, you're looking at close to a median value of about 5,000 CFU per 100 milliliters, whereas the water quality standard is 126. So more than an order of magnitude greater than our water quality standards. And just one other point, you know, uh, I had questions about, well, you know, is there any uh, uh, maybe resid bacteria that's left over from previous grazing operations and things like that? Uh, this site, these sites here, we established on uh, a, a brand new pasture on uh, a field that had been cropped for 20 years and hadn't been grazed for 20 years, so these three sites hadn't. Uh, SW12, this is at the USDA Riesel Watersheds. Uh, that's their uh, native prairie site. It hasn't been grazed since the station was established in the 1930s. So, shouldn't be any, res any uh, residual bacteria from any grazing, prior grazing from any of those ungrazed sites. And after I got our data, I mean, I was pretty surprised at those background concentrations that we saw. But after I started looking back in the literature, started seeing that even dating back to the 70s and 80s when we were measuring fecal coliform and ungrazed pastures, we were seeing uh, fecal coliform levels of six to 10,000. And then in some more recent studies looking at the E. coli, we're seeing very similar results to, to what we found. So those resident wildlife populations are contributing a, a significant amount of loading and concentrations uh, in the runoff. We were also fortunate enough in our edge of field runoff study to show the impacts of, of migratory wildlife, predominantly uh, uh, migratory birds. In October of 2009, our concentrations went through the roof at all three of our monitoring sites uh, outside of College Station in the, in the Brazos Bottom area. And we hadn't grazed our two graze sites in probably four or five months because it had been a very dry year and so we hadn't really been able to do any grazing there. But I show the data here from our ungrazed site and you can see how throughout our whole two years uh, monitoring data that I've got shown here, um, it rocked along here pretty low and then it just shot up through the roof. And in fact, more than 80% of our E. coli loading uh, in 2009 at those three sites came from wildlife. So those migratory wildlife can have a tremendous impact on your bacteria loading and your bacteria concentration. So you've got your resident wildlife that can have an impact and contribute to those background base loadings. And then that migratory uh, birds and wildlife come in and really spike your concentrations as well. So to wrap up, you know, our BST has been tremendously helpful with us, particularly in our discussions with the regulatory agencies about, you know, this isn't all a cattle issue. Uh, you know, there are other big contributors, particularly with, with wildlife. And the, the cattlemen have been more, uh, they've been more willing to come to the table and work with us because they say, okay, we're, we're part of the problem, 
we're not the sole problem here. You know, we can do our part. So it's kind of really help help things out there. But wildlife is certainly, you know, a huge source of bacteria, contributing 50% in our, the rural watersheds that we've looked at. Um, and that was confirmed, as I showed you, with our edge of field monitoring that we've done. So looking forward, going down the road, uh, some of the implications are those background and wildlife loadings really need to be considered when applying our water quality standards. I've made several pitches to EPA in our region that we don't need to be applying those water quality standards to these runoff events. We really need to exempt those because there's no way to achieve water quality standards after a runoff event just due to the background loadings alone. So our water quality standards during those runoff events are unachievable. So we need to figure out some ways to better integrate this information, this data, into our water quality uh, standards. Secondly, as I've already talked about, while you're developing team DLs and other watershed plans and strategies for uh, developing uh, or for addressing the bacteria issues, you've really got to start figuring out a way to integrating these background and wildlife loadings. If you don't, you know, we're going to have water quality standards that are going to be non-attainable, particularly during those runoff events. And, uh, and then we're going to have inaccurate load allocations and reductions in our TMDLs and watershed plans. There's a lot of questions remain. You know, how do we better integrate that background and wildlife loadings into water quality management? Uh, you know, how do we integrate it into our standards and how those are applied? How do we integrate that into our, our planning and how we ultimately implement to address those bacteria issues? What can and should we do to address uh, the wildlife loadings? You know, should we go in and start massacring raccoons and deer and everything like that to get rid of those? Or should we recognize that those are just a, a natural part of, of the ecosystem there and uh, make allowances for that? Um, another thing I didn't point out, we do continue with our BST, have about 12% of those isolates we can identify. So some of the things that we're looking at now is, you know, are there, you're seeing more and more in the literature discussion of naturalized soil-borne E. coli concentration. So that's uh, some work that we're currently doing. And we continually work to expand our BST library to bring in new species of animals so we can hopefully uh, reduce the amount of unidentified isolates that, that we have with our studies. So I'll leave you with a quote and then take any questions, but there's an old German proverb that says, in wine there is wisdom, in beer there is strength, and in water there is bacteria. So, <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, a couple of questions. I, I'd like to hear how you move from presence absence to percentage and proportion. Uh, and you keep mentioning loading, so you're actually looking at concentration times volume, you're looking at the, the magnitude of water flowing through streams so that you're really attributing load versus concentration in small volumes. Okay, um, uh, the first part of the question is uh, uh, move from presence absence to the percentages. And so basically the percentages that I presented are the percentages of the isolates that we um, sourced within a, from a water sample that came from the different, you know, from cattle or from wildlife and so forth. So we're looking at percentage of isolates, not the percentage necessarily uh, of the E. coli concentration. Uh, there's uh, some other biostatistics that go along with all of that, but um, we're looking specifically at the percentage of, of the isolates. On the loading side that I was talking about, that really goes back more to our edge of field monitoring that we've done where we do actually have the E. coli concentrations and the runoff volume so you can actually look specifically at the loads there. Yes? Sure. Did you see much overlap between species as far as E. coli so it's the or the uh, rabbit, like the cat uh, overlapping the human isolates? Uh, the question is, did we, did we see much overlap uh, of isolates uh, between, like, say, uh, cats or uh, some of the other domesticated animals with humans. And we actually do see some, especially with dogs. 
Um, I mean, you say it's 70% from the cat and 15% from the domestic, but if they're overlapping, is that going <coughs> to skew those numbers? If you go to the breakdown where we're looking at the individual species, but when we get to the point of looking at human versus domesticated animals uh, versus wildlife, um, it's a very minimal impact at, at that level. But if you go down and try to identify specifically the percentage from dogs and cats versus humans, um, there's a there's potential for that. So there are some some species that of uh, the E. coli that you find in both, or well, yes, isolates. Yes. All right. I was, I was wondering if your information uh, inspired the you know water quality regulators and your wildlife managers to begin any discussions of how you know how they're going to address this 50% of the you know, E. coli in the water sheds. About the only thing that it's inspired is uh, well. Feral hogs are a big issue in, in Texas, so you know that's the wildlife species that's been really targeted for for any reductions. Um, but we haven't really gotten too deep into discussions specifically of you know, what do we do with this information. So I, I mean, that's still a big question for us: is all right, we've got this information now, how do we use it best? All right, um, thank you, Thank you.